the big thing for me is just the receiver binge that we're on right now, where the market for receivers is starting to edge toward quarterbacks. We talked about this the last time you were on. Ben Solak theorized that the Christian Kirk contract that he got making almost $20 million a year annually just basically threw a grenade into the salary cap system where every guy's like, wait, that guy's making that? Well, I want this. And we've had so much movement. The, the shocking one for me, the more I thought about it over the weekend was the A.J. Brown, who's only 24. It's not like a Tyreek Hill situation where he's about to hit his 30s. Like you can kind of see the Chiefs wanting to, um, you know, maybe save some money in one place, try to reboot, try to get some rookie contracts in there. But the A.J. Brown thing, if you can't make it work with him, what's the point of having a contender? So what's your big takeaway with all this wide receiver movement? I thought the draft was interesting in that there were four wide receivers that were deemed by everybody as the guys. And you get these guys on rookie deals and it's Drake London and it was Garrett Wilson and it was Chris Olave and it was Jamison Williams. And I had multiple coaches who had picks in the 20s calling me a couple of weeks in advance being like, is there any way Jamison falls? And I'm like, no, he's not. He will, Those guys will not escape the top 12. And they did not escape the top 12. And there was this four receiver draft. And there were two guys who were viewed as like late first, early seconds. And they went 16 and 18. And that was Dotson and Burks. And there's a big drop off. And then you start getting into the Christian Watsons and the Wandale Robinsons and the George Pickens and the rest. So those four guys were viewed as future number ones. And teams were willing to do everything it took to get into the top 12 to get those guys. When the Eagles realized that they weren't going to be able to get one of those players, they were like, all right, we'll do this deal with A.J. Brown. Now, the Titans, from what I gather, Tannehill was surprised that they couldn't come to terms with him. Uh, Mike Vrabel was doing local media about two weeks ago. and he Three said, weeks long, ago. He said, as, yeah, no as way. As long as I'm the head coach, he'll be on my team. But I think negotiations went in a certain way where they're like, we can't pay him what he wants. And for Howie Roseman and the Eagles to thread that needle to not only find a trade partner, which were the Tennessee Titans, to not only find the number one guy who's 24 years old, but also come to terms with a contract, all what seemed to be in a 24-hour span. This was not done weeks in advance. Like They were calling around, but it really accelerated on draft day. It was pretty miraculous. And I think Tennessee, who was the one seed last year in the AFC, I feel like the vibe out of that place is, yeah, we weren't we weren't able to pay him, but also like shocking all a little bit that if they don't pay that guy, well, then what does that say about the status of our team? Well, and then you had the Marquise Brown trade, AK Hollywood, which I that was a jaw dropper for me because I was like, wait a second, that guy's not worth the twenty third pick. Like I I don't get it. But then you you see like how the Packers didn't even draft a receiver, and you think like. I, I guess the market just shifted so dramatically on the receivers that it wasn't even about Holly. And I'm not defending the Cardinals because I thought that was a bad trade. Mm -hmm. But the market shifted so dramatically on receivers that all of a sudden Hollywood Brown, I guess, technically was kind of worth the 23rd pick if you could get the, you know, a third rounder back, which they got the 100th pick back. Get him, they have him under a two year deal. You could make the case his stats were better than I realized last year. Yeah. I know it's a 17 game season, but you got over a thousand yards. Um, they, he, he could ostensibly be a deep threat. Wasn't like the Ravens were exactly, uh, bombs away last year. So no, and I, there's a world you could talk yourself into it. So I kind of see it from their perspective more than I did Thursday night. And to your point, they weren't getting one of those top six wide receivers. So you're now looking at the seventh wide receiver. And I knew going into this, they were taking offense no matter what with that 23rd pick. It was either going to be offensive line or wide receiver. The last two drafts, they took inside linebackers and Zayvon Collins and Isaiah Simmons. That's not what Cliff or Kyler necessarily play to their strength. Um, so they were going to get a wide receiver. They went and got one. Now, from what I hear, it was a done deal for about a week, maybe several weeks, and they kept it quiet and didn't say wow. anything. And they knew that this was going to be the trade. They already came to terms with it. And they came to terms with that, the Cardinals, when they realized they weren't getting one of those top guys. And so Hollywood is not only Kyler's buddy, they were best friends at Oklahoma. And I know that this is not so much an olive branch to Kyler, but like, we're going to get you your guy. We're doing everything we can. They also might have seen this DeAndre Hopkins suspension coming down the pike that not everyone mm, in the media might have known. That and we they apparently to, happened five months ago. That they wanted to maybe protect themselves a little bit and just make sure they got a number one. I'll say this, with the speed that Hollywood Brown brings, now forget whether he's a 
number one wide receiver or not. You add him to Rondell Moore, which they already have. You know, obviously DeAndre is going to be coming back, and then they also have uh, Zach Ertz, who they like, and then AJ Green's coming back. It's a pretty good receiver f- options for him now from the Baltimore side. You know, uh, Lamar's response was like WTF and everything, but like yeah. from what I hear. Hollywood was was pretty happy to get out of there knowing that he was never going to get that huge second contract unless he left that system in Baltimore, which does not bode well for any wide receivers, let alone a guy that wants to be paid like a number one wide receiver. So if they, if the pick they got back with Brown was like 70, I think people would have been like, oh, all right, interesting trade. But because it was a hundred, then it's like, wow, they didn't get enough. But you think like, if they're trying to keep Kyler Murray happy, if they're all in on trying to just repair that relationship, it's almost like they had to throw in an extra 30 spots just to kind of lock it down to try to keep that piece happy. I there, I thought the trade by, I just don't understand the draft pick. I know they have the chart, but like the Minnesota trade confused me the most because you just mentioned how... Were, yeah. You just mentioned like basically everybody wanted to get in the top 12. That 12 spot that they had was maybe the most pivotal thing. Once those other three wide receivers went off the board, it was like Jamison Williams and then a huge drop off on everyone's board to Dotson and Burks and then off that. So that 12 spot was huge. Not only did they trade within a division, they traded and they didn't get a first round pick back. I thought it was very strange trade. And, you know, Questy's a first time general manager and everyone calls him the econ GM. Yeah, they're thrilled with it. They like what they got because they thought that they didn't need that position. They wanted uh, defensive backs. They got Lewis seen later on in the first round with that 32nd pick. But um, around the league, people were scratching their heads and everyone was complimenting the Lions for being so aggressive in making the trade. But the Vikings clearly had a a plan also, and they didn't see that as a major drop off. And they still got their player, the safety at 32. 